guess we can go ahead and start. Good morning, everybody. Glad to have you here. I wish you were all sitting down here in the front row. <laughs> and I could sit on the chair and we could just talk in a circle, but <laughs> I miss the small classroom when we all sat around in circles. But anyway, good morning. Good morning. Beautiful Sabbath today. As usual, the weather was right, it's getting windy out there, but I think it's a, overall a very nice day. I'm thankful for that. I, I had a very nice week. I have no complaints. I felt, it's, it's always hard for me to come go over here because I'm so used to sleeping and letting my car drive me to church. <laughs> Don't do that anymore. But I, I felt so fortunate this morning because when I got on, oh, Omaha Street in St. Pat was a bad accident there. And I don't know, I only saw one car and it rolled in the ditch and it rolled and rolled and people were standing out holding babies and clothes all over and everything. The cops were coming from everywhere and I, I prayed to God to help, help those people in the time of need and I thank God that I haven't gotten in an accident. And, you know, so I, I feel thankful I'm here today, but a lot of you see a lot of tragedies out there. I never expected to see somebody rolling in the ditch this hour of the morning, but we'll probably hear about it a little later. But uh, kind of a <laughs> sad, cruel world we live in, isn't it? Anyway, we are at the end of our lesson book this time. It's on witnessing, and I was wondering, the lesson asked us what we, what we have learned from this 13 weeks of studying, uh, being witnesses for Christ. It, one of the first lessons we had was why witnessing? When some witnessing the power of personal testimony and then seeing people through Jesus' eyes, I think that our lesson touches on that today is how we see Jesus, can we, can we see people by Jesus' eyes, you know? Do we ever try to do that? I, <laughs> I have to ask myself that, but I think, oh, I don't know. Anyway, I'm thankful for being here. I'm just wondering if there's any of you that had any experience you wanted to share today of your thankfulness for what the Lord has done for you, what kind of witnessing you could you could do for Jesus this morning and for your church and your church family. I, I am just always thankful for getting through another week. Lots of turmoil going on in this world. Almost to me it seems like more turmoil than I've ever seen in my life. But maybe that's just because it's present and hitting me in the face right now. Uh, somebody told me once years ago that every experience you go through and while you're going through that experience it seems like it's the worst experience you ever had so so maybe this is just another one of those bad experiences <laughs> and I pray to God he'll give us a reprieve here and for those who haven't given their life to the Lord and maybe a little undecided. We need to pray for them. And I know that God's holding the wind to strike back for a lot of people to make up their minds. Let's have prayer before we get started. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful this morning to be here. We're thankful for your love and your care and your concern. And thankful that you are uh, the guiding force in this world and you will carry us through. Uh, we just ask that you bless us, Lord. We ask that you bless our church, our church, our world church in general. Uh, we ask that you give us the power and the strength to hold on till the end. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's turn to the 13th lesson here today. They stepped in faith.
you, <laughs> sometimes I often wonder the bothers if when we come to the lesson, maybe we ought to have, maybe we ought to take a test and see how much how much we re re remember. But if you had to turn to the front of the lesson the first page and and see what the topic of each lesson was, and if you were to write a little synopsis of each one of them, I wonder how you how you would fare. Uh, Like, like number six, it says that there's unlimited possibilities. Number four, prayer power interceding for others. I myself have to say I probably don't do enough of that, but this one caught my eye, seeing people through Jesus' eyes. I don't know, do you think that's possible? It's, it's, it's necessary. <laughs> if we're going to love like he loved, we're going to have to see him as he sees him and uh, hear them as he hears them. So part of our prayer, part of our devotional life should be asking God to give us his eyes and see, and see how he sees. And so when you see, when you try to see people through Jesus' eyes, do you feel frustrated because you can't help them or, or you don't know how to help them? We've talked about this in, in our lesson before, the last time I caught it. I talked about all the people that are standing on the street corners begging for money. Uh, I had a guy yesterday walk up to me. I was in my car and he was walking. He, he, gives me, he asked me if I had a quarter to spare. And he was, wasn't, usually that's a Native American's trick. They want to, they'll just ask for a little quarter or something. A little spare change. He asked me for a quarter, but I almost kind of laughed. And then he tells me this story, a big long story about he got his whole backpack ripped off from him, everything he had in it. And, and this was in that case where a whole bunch of guns got stolen, and he realized they were stolen, so he called the cops and they were handling it. And there was one more person they had to catch and maybe get his backpack fast. Well, anyway, that's his story he told me. So I giving a handful of quarters, but do, do you see somebody like that in Jesus' eyes and, and you, like Jesus would see them, but how do you help them? There, there are so many people that stand on the street corners, and I just heard it again, they told us not to give those people money because they contribute to alcohol, and so they said give it, if you've got money, give it to an organization that is helping those people, so you'll know for sure it gets there. But don't you still feel guilty? I mean, I would like to know how Jesus views those people, wouldn't you? It's, it is it is frustrating to say the least. Of what is your part in that? Give them a dollar and hope they go away? Is that the answer? Oh, sure, I don't know. Anyway. What? Oh yeah, you can hardly tell them what to do with what not to do. Or a candy bar or whatever, which is to you if he's asking for a buck or not. It's I you remember. Was it Peter and John that said Silver and gold, I don't have any, but I've got something greater than that to give to you. You think that's the answer for our homeless people? At, at the you need to make people big before you can just If you take, pull your mask down, then I, I can hear you. No, I'm not going to pull my mask down. I said, we need to make people needs before we can cleanse Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know what that person's need was. You know, we don't know these people. What's their need? They're, you know, before you can try to raise people spiritually, you've got to meet, meet their mental or physical needs. And they need to meet in Christ. And a lot of us don't want that, do they, at the moment? Uh, let me ask you this question. Here. It is sort of in our lesson, but later down in the lesson, but I'll ask it now. 
What is the best time to reach somebody? Is it the best time to reach this guy when he's, when he's panhandling you for money? Or when do you think is the best time, the best opportunity to, to reach people? When you first meet them. When you first meet them? Yeah. Your, your attitude towards them is going to tell them whether you're any good or not. Well, yeah, that, that was seeing them through Jesus' eye because he, he never did have a, a bad attitude toward any of them. But the answer in the lesson book was the best time to meet people is in their hour of need when they are the most desperate. Okay. When they come to you, they're in their hour of need. Okay, when they come to you, that's another big uh, plus that you said when they come to you. You don't necessarily go out to the bar and drag them out and try to, try to evangelize them, then, then I'm just using that as an example. It's when they come to you in their hour of need is the best time to reach them. And I have found people are more willing to listen once they, they've lost a loved one or they've discovered they're terribly, terribly sick or they've lost. Well, you know, the, when, we, when we perform these acts of kindness to, to people, um, it ought to be kindness. And uh, if, if somebody is going to take your act of kindness and buy a, 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 a bottle of liquor with it, you're not being kind to them. You're enabling them. But what you, what you can do is offer, offer help and what they need. And uh, sometimes they don't need another bottle of liquor. They need uh, somebody to help them up out of the gutter. And, and sometimes people got to hit the bottle before they, they can look up. And it's, it's just difficult, and not all of us are equipped to deal with, with those things, but our act of kindness that we're showing people in their hour of need should meet their need, not their want. If that makes sense. Yeah, that, if you're all hearing, you said it should meet their needs, not their wants. And then you have to be discerning and not to know what their needs are. <clears throat> that might not be the simplest thing either, is it? Well, we need to pray for discernment. It's what did you say? I said we need to pray for discernment. Right. Um, well, today's lesson starts out with uh, Philippians 2 5. Turn to Philippians 2 5, and it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to let? Or, let your mind, let this mind, Jesus' mind, be in you. What is Jesus' mind? you know what Jesus' mind is? Self-sacrificing. Okay, pastor suggests it's self-sacrificing. And uh, there is some, can you think of other things that, Compassion. Go ahead. Compassion. Compassion. And I had a list of oh man, I don't know what to have. The one the mind of Christ is one of ministry and service. It is one of mercy. It's one of compassion. It's one of forgiveness. And it's one of grace. That is the mind of Christ. And I had to ask myself, how do I measure up to that one? How do I measure up to the mind of Christ? He's, he's all of this. He's, first of all, he is one of ministry and service. So if we're going to have the mind of Christ, we have to be... So in other words... When we meet somebody, we should get on this checklist and see where we're at to help them. 
No, I don't. I, th I think, I think, uh, like Pastor suggested, praying for discernment, and then, you, then you, you have an inner feeling of what, what's going on. You've got to weigh everything that you see in a moment in a flash, and what's coming out of this person's mouth. So you have to, you have to show some mercy and some compassion. And, and I think probably forgiveness to this, this person that's down and out at the moment, you know, and you can't start blaming him for, for getting himself into that situation. It, it's, it's almost like the woman that was dragged caught in adultery. Did Jesus point out all the awful things she'd done all of her life to get herself into that situation? No, he, he forgave her. He said, your, your sins are forgiven. But he did say, go and sin no more. So, let's go back to the rest of that text. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Uh, I gave you the list of this. Is it necessary for each one of us to have every one of these gifts? Does every one of us need the, the gift of mercy, of compassion, forgiveness, and grace? Do we, do we need every one of these? I, I think we do. Um, I, I know all the pastors in this church. I, and I, like, I like all our pastors. Really, as far as that goes, but he you know, he said something like, "Mercy is the lowest on my totem pole of, of gifts." So, whatever he meant by that, he had a, a little tough time with that one. He said so. The pastor suggests that we we do we need some kind of a measure of every one of these uh, in order to qualify for having the mind of Christ. I'll finish reading this. It's, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, uh, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. I'm going to read it out of my version, and I don't always like my version all that well either, but this one says, says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. When I first read that, I didn't, well, I didn't like it near as well as let this mind be in you, which is in Christ, but here it says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Yeah. We must have a, a, a good attitude, don't we? Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as some, something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his design and privilege. You know, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something that he had, had to cling to. That's this version. Instead of giving up his divine privilege, he took the humble position of a slave. <laughs> he was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. And, and his, you might call his reward Therefore, God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all the names. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of, of God the Father. Over on Sunday's lesson, it talks about <laughs> well, I need to have some water there. But... <laughs> I often thought when I get ready to teach the 
class, the devil can throw a lot of stuff in the box anyway. And you get here and you get up in front. <laughs> You've gone through a lot of stumbling blocks. So. On Sunday's lessons, Jesus is self-sacrificing love. And we've, we've gone through some of that, having this mind of Christ, which is service. said, Jesus, who was equal with God from all eternity, this, this puts it much simpler too. Jesus was equal with God from all eternity, all eternity, made himself of no reputation. What does it mean, no reputation? Others come first. I don't want to say it crudely, but he says, I'll be the nobody and you're the somebody. Okay, how does that, how do you deal with that self thing there? Isn't it the top of your mind all the time that you want to have a good reputation? You know, just, uh, you don't want somebody ruining your reputation either, and you don't want to, and you don't want uh, to ruin it yourself, you want that, that word is in there for some reason, made himself of no reputation. He was a nobody when he was born in a manger with hay and cows all around him. It says this also is a fascinating Greek expression. Expression. It literally can be translated emptying yourself. Emptying yourself of, of, uh, of self. Jesus voluntarily emptied himself of his privilege and prerequisite of God's equal to take on a form of a man and become a humble servant. Humble servant of humanity. Uh, we can't even comprehend that, can we? Uh, I, I, I can't think of, I don't think of myself in my life of having any great significant reputation to have to to empty myself of it but think of you in your life how do you empty yourself of self or, or don't you think it's necessary or doesn't self ever get in the way of you um, how do you empty yourself totally of self when you stop to help somebody, you don't think of what you're going to do about it. You're helping somebody. You're not looking for glory all the time. You're looking for helping people and get it. What feather you can put in your crown. We, we have a problem with the me, me, I. It shouldn't be that way. We should be thinking about somebody else instead of us all the time. See, it's nice for what you said, but let's take it a little bit farther. How about emptying ourselves when we, we've all joined this church. We've all had to be asked to do things. Sometimes uh, you get your feelings hurt because of a lots of different reasons. Sometimes people aren't very nice to you. Sometimes people, it seems like, is, is wanting your job. And there's people, numerous people that get mad and don't come back for such insignificant little things. When you get mad at somebody at your church, is that emptying yourself of self? Or, or, or is that you letting your little self get in the way? I have, I have seen it too often. I have seen it happen to myself. I have had to take myself to task. I, I know that years back and we were having this trouble in our church and then it was almost going to be dividing somebody that I knew very, very well and you knew very, very well said we would go and to a different church. We'd pull out of this church right now and go to a different church. We didn't know where else to go. I mean, there's, no, there's nowhere else to go. So if, if you lived in Arizona, or my brothers do. There's churches all over the place. You get mad at one, you move on to the next one pretty easily with no problem. But 
is that emptying of, you, of yourself of self? When, when you get into that trouble, it's time to pray really hard and it's also time to leave it in God's hands and, 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 and wait on God. And I'll tell you what, I've waited on God a lot this worked out a lot. A lot of times in the 37 years I've been a member of this church, Yes, I have been tempted to get mad and tell the pastor exactly how I feel and, and tell him how people are picking on me and tell him how to run his business and, and you know, but that's, that's old self creeping in again. And, it, and you have to fight against self all the time because we all have a certain amount of pride and I don't, maybe, Pride and emptying yourself are two different things. You need to analyze the word pride. You have to have some little pride in yourself to stay close to God, uh, to follow God and, and follow His guidance and His wisdom. But old self has a way of, you know, this creeping up. I, I don't know if I can get this across to you, but I'm telling you right now, I try to keep my body very, very healthy so that I can glorify God in it. And if that's being prideful, I have a, I have a, a, a grandson telling the story of uh, my family, but he came over to the house the other day. He's been in drugs. I wasn't there. He was, my husband did not recognize him. My husband talked to him for 15 minutes and didn't know who he was. And, and I have a picture of him when he was the cutest, sweetest little boy. And, and when he was a teenager and when he was in high school. And he has destroyed himself. And that's what I'm talking about. Pride in yourself so you can glorify Jesus Christ. Not yourself. I have been picked on. Oh, I'll let you talk first. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a hard time telling people anymore. And this has just happened in the past several years. I'm proud of you. I hear that a lot. I am so proud of you. <laughs> Right. And so I've been trying to find other ways to say that, you know, I'm pleased. I'm glad. But Shirley, I got to tell you a little bit about, we kind of think it's a miracle in our life. When we were going down to the church in uh, Arizona, we had, well, we had two daughters down there that had issues. And one daughter really had some issues and stuff, got into some stuff. Anyway, if you had told me this had happened two years ago, I would not have believed it. She's going to the church now. She is a um, youth leader. And they, she's gotten wonderful support. And everything has totally, and I mean almost totally, turned around for her. And we are so thankful to God for that. Amen. Really? All right. I think uh, maybe a, a better word is our self-worth. And that comes from realizing that Christ died for us. We are very worthy because the price he paid for us. We're bought by the price. We're bought by, by his blood. And well, that gives, she gives a self-worth that we are worth something because Christ died for us. Uh, there are people who are very humble, but they sometimes get prideful in how humble they are. And so it comes to back to the same thing. Uh, so yes, I agree we should take, the Bible says, we are the Bible temple of the Spirit, and we should take care of our bodies because of that. Uh, that all comes back to 
we do it because of Christ and not because our own uh, self glory that Nebuchadnezzar said, look what I have done. You know, we can do things, but because of Christ. And we lose that connection when we're off road. So you're, you're saying we have this self worth because Jesus thought we were worthy enough to die for us. That's a, that's a very good point. I, what I was about to say was, I, yeah, I, I agree that we have a self look because of Jesus Christ, and I have, I have been taught that all my life. But I was raised a vegetarian on a farm, out in the middle of nowhere, and we went to church every Sabbath and all that. But we. It was not easy for us to be vegetarian. We were criticized all the time. I've been criticized a good share of my life for my lifestyle. And my nephew, he was here uh, a few months ago, and I was able to talk to him for a while. It was my sister's son, and the first one in my first grandchildren child my parents had. But he, there was always this big rift in the family. My sister married this guy that he, they weren't raised like we were. They had no religious upbringing whatsoever. And I, I, I tried to, and he, 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 he felt the rift between the two families because he was sort of pulled between the two. But, uh, and I tried to tell him, well, my sister married totally a man she should not have married because he had not her values whatsoever. I, I, my nephew, right at the moment, is feeling the repercussions of his father's lifestyle and, and how he went that broke a little bit too, and he's needing a liver transplant, so I was trying to tell him about my father and his grandfather and why there was such a rift, because I said, when my sister married your father, we could, we was over there at their house one time, it was on a, on a Saturday night, stopped in there for a minute. They were all sitting around playing cards. They were smoking cigarettes. They were drinking alcohol. They were eating big plates of cheeses and sausages, and we didn't even get cheese. And the whole total lifestyle, I said, your, your father's lifestyle was totally different than our stock lifestyle, and your father's lifestyle criticized us. My brother-in-law used to drink and smoke cigarettes and, and, and say, I'm going to have another cigarette for my coffee. Well, he died of uh, cancer of the lung, so he did have enough nails in his coffin by that. But I said, don't you, don't you understand the difference between the two families? I glory in the fact of the way my father raised us, and my father raised us out of the Bible, you know, and out of the teachings of his church. And to this day, practically all of us in our family are very, very happy. And I think that, like you said, we have self-worth and we, we glory in the fact that Jesus Christ uh, you can't thought we life. were worth saving. But you can't run your lifestyle down somebody else's foot. I know, we didn't do that. I, I made him feel guilty. I should have maybe talked to my, my nephew years and years ago and tried to explain to him. I, I, you know, he didn't even vocalize how he was feeling at that time. He, he did to me just a few months ago how he was feeling. And no, we, my father realized he could not do anything. Once my sister married that man and went off and accepted his lifestyle, he said to himself, I've done everything I can for her. Now it's up to her. So. Right. Okay. My, I, I told this story before, but my earliest um, uh, memories of life, the Adventist church down on the reservation, my father had a friend that was Adventist. We weren't, but our friend, and he, um, he plowed his fields and planted his um, crops, he left areas in the corner for the wildlife. Pretty soon, my dad was not, rather than, you know, out in the square corners and going clear up to the end of the ditch. So pretty soon, my dad was doing the same. 
and he wasn't an Adventist, you know, pretty soon other people were doing the same. And it was because they knew this guy and they liked him. He was very well liked. But um, it kind of bothers me sometimes that there's not an Adventist um, church down in Gatesville anymore because there was quite a community there. Um, so, and I remember very specifically when he came over to help us with cattle or when he came over to help us stuff, do stuff, if my mother baked him a pie or baked pie or had stuff for him, um, she would use Crisco or she would use something that wasn't rather than lard. And they'd tell him, you know, um, this is something that you can eat. And the same way, she always kept, she always kept postal around. So if the other people wanted coffee, they could have it, but he'd have postal. And right now, you know, there was lots of things that were wrong down on that reservation. But how often does that happen, that people have that respect for each other's beliefs? And he didn't have to, he didn't have to flaunt it. No. No. He was just acting himself. You don't have to flaunt it. See what's going on and don't respect it. Yeah. Don't fall. Well, you, you can ask the question, what would you, what are you willing to hang on to um, that you would give up Christ for? What what would you cling to if you said, I don't want Jesus, I want this instead? Because the having the mind of Christ, Jesus gave up everything. Everything in order to get, uh, uh, provide for us and to save us. What would we cling to and hang on to and say, you know what, I'm not willing to do these things up. And so, um, you know, I, I, I rarely miss ham sandwiches now, you know. Uh, that was one of the easier things to give up. But other people have harder things in their life. And, and it's tragic, it's tragic when we do find something in this world that we would rather have than a relationship with Christ. Because that's, that's the whole gist of have this mind in you. That he have the attitude of self-sacrifice and service rather than on self-serving and no sacrifice. That's what we're all kind of talking about. But pastor. Jesus didn't go out and say, hey, I'm Jesus, you've got to follow me and do this, or you're going to have a bad lifestyle. Jesus was a man that was humble and accepted people where they were at. He didn't fall, and people came to him. They did. He asked his disciples to, to quit fishing. Yeah. And he fished with the men. Uh, he asked them to quit collecting taxes and quit collect souls. You know, I mean, there's he asked a, the fishing. Young ruler to go sell it in hand. Yeah. It was a hard, it was a hard thing. It was, and so some people will react differently to the call of Christ. And he didn't flaunt his, his uh, uh, better than God. That's what the Pharisees were doing. But he said, your righteousness needs to exceed theirs. I like, I like what Jane was saying back there when she was testifying to what that Adventist man did uh, on the reservation. There is a, a, a quote from the Desire of Ages that I would like to read to you, especially the last sentence. That the, it says, there is a wonderful statement by God's last day messenger that we can take with us as we finish out our class this quarter. Our confession of his faithfulness in heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. Our, our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency. Uh, that agency is, is um, uh, we're confessing of God's faithfulness. That's one part of this, which kind of kind of struck me, but that's not the point I want. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for really re revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge that his grace was made th through, made known through holy men of old, 
but that which will be the most effective is the testimony of our own experience. We are witnessing for God as we reveal in ourselves the workings of a power that is divine. And I will say that, that that man was not preaching to those people, but he was witnessing for God through himself and how he acted and how his attitude was. And first of all, he, he helped those people. And, and once you were helping those people and, and showing them that, that you, you love them and you really care for them and you're con concerned for them, then it's easier to go, go on with other things. So I'm glad that there was an address down there that could reveal himself to those people. He was a sermon in shoes rather than a sermon. What? He was a sermon in shoes. Right. <laughs> so, and then, then it, the question is asked is, is that there are many people who fail to witness because they are unsure of what to say. Have you ever, are, are you a little afraid to witness to people? And, 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 and probably because you're going to be get put down. Other, other people are fearful of rejection or embarrassment. And then it says, what is some of the most common reasons you think that people are hesitant to witness? other than the above. <clears throat> maybe maybe you haven't been given the opportunity. Uh, I'm and I'm not the most outgoing person and it's it's nice, it is wonderful to witness to people if they're if they're wanting it and if they're if they're willing for it and if they're coming to you in their in in their hour of needs. I I enjoy that more than everything else, but to go out and 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 witness to people who you know probably are going to reject you, and, and you're not so sure whether they'll reject you or not, and you're not so sure just how much you can get in there before they shut you off. But uh, what are some of the fears that we have, and what are some of the reasons? Why is there? Why are we so afraid that we won't know what to say, or why are we so afraid um, of being rejected? You have any, uh, why are you afraid of being rejected? It's, and, and we've been told by the Bible, by the Bible, they're not rejecting. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Jesus said. So we have to remember, or remember that part of it, that maybe, maybe we're a little afraid to witness because or we're, we're, we're afraid of being put down because we haven't died to self either. I don't know. I'm, Well, I, 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 I know that, uh, but let me tell you this story about my husband loves to preach and he can be the most, pardon me God, but he can be the most obnoxious man in the world sometimes. <laughs> and I can lay off on of him, they don't want to hear it anymore, you've done everything you can to stop preaching to him, to his kids and all that. But And one of his, his, his sons said, to me, well, Dad didn't preach so much to us, we talked to him more often, and I said, well, that's just who he is, and if, and if you can't take the preaching, then I guess you just don't get to talk to him. But you know what, when, when, when you hear things like that, you learn, and so you think in your mind, what should I have said that was better? And the next time somebody says that to me, oh, his, his, his other son said, is Dad still, or Dad, are you still preaching? <laughs> I'm going to say to them, 
Well, yeah, but you know, Noah preached to his sons for 120 years. Do you think they didn't get tired of it? Do you, do you think they didn't think he was being obnoxious and overbearing? And Think of the story of, of Noah. 120 years he preached to those people while he was building that ship. Putting it into perspective, he put everything into that boat he had because why not? Everything, he believed everything was going to be destroyed. So I even see maybe in the last few years he even lived in the boat because he had nobody else to live because he's putting everything into it. He was hiring people to help him build it. And he was preaching to them while he was hiring in order for them to get paid for the labor they had to listen to him preach for 120 years. Is that obnoxious? You know, when I, when I, yeah, James said, yeah, that's obnoxious, yeah. It, it probably is obnoxious, but maybe we shouldn't worry about being obnoxious. You don't know what kind of seed you're planting, do you? Sometimes people hate you, don't they, for what you do. I've told you this story, most of you have heard it, about when we first went down to start feeding at the mission, and the guy that down there had, he was the spiritual leader down there, and he was so afraid of us, he was afraid we were going to, we insisted on preaching the sermon, we're going to feed the temple food, we're going to preach, we're going to do the spiritual food too, so he was watching us pretty close, but he was, he was mad, he didn't like our, our lifestyle, he didn't like the food we were serving. And, and uh, we did not preach to him, we didn't do anything but take his insults. My old self got in the way again and I said when I went down there, that man insults us one more time and we're pulling out of here and we're not going to feed him anymore. Well, when we went down there that time he was really nice to us for some reason. But to make a long story short, he was terribly, terribly sick, and then he went to his doctor, and his doctor said, look, boy, you change your lifestyle, or you're not going to make it. And he, he did. Uh, and then he said to me, if I had known what I know now, I don't know if I'm running out of time. He said, if I had known all of this in my lifetime, maybe I wouldn't be in such bad health now. And you know, that that touched our hearts. It, it, it really did something to me to think that I let old self get in the way and I was ready to tell him what he could do with this program. We were out of here. But, and I don't know how much good we did for him. He was so sick that he finally had to quit working. So I assume he probably died shortly after that. But, but to, have other people verify our health message and then he realizing the fact that he had been in the wrong all, all the time and if he had lived a better health, healthier style, he wouldn't be as sick as he was. So you don't know who you might touch, who you're irritating, but it might be touching him in the end too. These are the things that we don't, we don't know the outcome about. But the only, when are we supposed to quit, B? 10 10 2? Oh, I didn't think it was 10. Well, I guess we better quit then. Uh, this was a good lesson. Of, I hope we can take a lot of this to heart.
Let's yeah. pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness. We want to thank you this morning that we have the privilege of, of helping in your ministry to save every soul for your kingdom. We just ask that you give us your power and your understanding and your discernment and we can see people through Jesus' eyes. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.